Dr. Pin, it's lovely to be here together with you. Welcome. And we would like to welcome, along with Dr. Pin, I would like to welcome those of you. We have colleagues, alumni, current students, old students, all the new friends and family who are joining us. So welcome all of you. We looked at the list and we're both nervous and excited to be with you here today. Uh, in the next hour, uh, Dr. Pin and I will talk about health equity and leadership in the times of the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. I'll take a few minutes to sort of warm us up and then it will be a dialogue and let's see where we go with it. Um, so over the past four months, big data and numerous studies have revealed that the pandemic has hit people differently around the world. And these health inequities, uh, some, some of them have been uh, sex-based, right? It has, uh, the pandemic has hit men and women differently and shown uh, different susceptibilities. There's also, also data that has shown that uh, there are socioeconomic differences, different classes have been hit differently. And in this picture, what is truly striking to me is to realize that even if we're sitting at home and thinking, oh, there's something happening and somebody is sick around the world, let's say it starts in China or in Turkey, right? We can no longer sit and think that does not concern me. So globalization has shown a different face as we realize that health of a stranger thousands of miles away on a different continent is actually our problem, individual problem. And even if we are not pro-socially, like we don't care about their health, it's actually a personal reason to care about health inequities and do something about it. So Dr. Pin, I'm excited to start this conversation and talk about leadership during these times. But even before we get, get to this, can we, let's spend a little bit of time talking about the health inequities and disparities. And my question to you is, what do you think have been driving these disparities that we've seen during COVID-19 pandemic? Well, first of all, it's been very interesting to note that men and women appear to be affected equally, but the death rate, the mortality rate is much greater for men than it is for women, uh, and especially older men, that we know that we thought that really the older population was at a higher mortality rate. And unfortunately, many, especially in this country, thought that younger people were not as badly affected, but we're beginning to see now deaths, not only in those in the 25 to 35 age range, but there have even been a couple of deaths of infants. So obviously, while we may see the older generation and see older men as the, at highest risk, we can't just say that it's limited to those populations. And then looking at the disparities that have been brought to bear in this country, it's really pointed out something that many of us have been aware of for a long time, and that is that there are health disparities in this country. And the, the, epi, the pandemic that we're going through right now has just made them much more apparent. There are several, there are a number of factors that have been recognized, I think, most of all, that social determinants of health, meaning income, socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. access to health care, feeling comfortable with the health care system. Uh, and of course, some call it racism. We can call it unconscious bias. Anyway, the biases that are built in probably have had a great effect on those who have access to care, who've had early detection, whether or not they have access to health care. And that gets into some of the other issues like the availability of testing, who was able to get testing early in order to be picked up or diagnosed before the condition got so severe that by the time they were seen in hospitals uh, or were, in, were sick enough to be admitted to hospitals or to get that test, uh, they were really in much worse shape and therefore much harder to, to bring about. Uh, there are also factors like we talk about the prevention of uh, how to take care of ourselves. Uh, for example, social distancing or working at home, virtual work. But many of those who are most affected by this pandemic in terms of the health disparities are those who are in service jobs. We talk about frontline. Well, certainly the nurses and the doctors and the uh, health care providers, but what about the people who push the stretches in the hospital? What about those who work in the pharmacies? What about those who are driving the buses to get those, get everyone to work? Uh, so many who are among the most affected are those who are still essential employees, may not be recognized as much as physicians and nurses. 
and don't have the luxury of staying at home because you can't be a virtual bus driver or you can't be a virtual clerk in the pharmacy at the drugstore. Uh, and so there are many contributing factors that we've seen, but I think it really, the pandemic has really just pointed out what we've known for a long time. And that is that there are health disparities in this country. It also has helped to point out something that we worked a lot on at the NIH while I was there in women's health. And that is looking at sex and gender differences and how they may contribute. Uh, there are some theories as to why men are uh, have a worse prognosis than women. One of those is that it may be, may be related to testosterone levels, but those haven't been proven and I don't wanna promote unproven theories because one of the major concerns that I have about this whole pandemic is, uh, the, is to promote what we know about science and scientific information rather than, than what is suspected. Said it beautifully. The pandemic has brought about what was already there. It has sort of surfaced our blind spots. My learning, and I sort of I've been looking into data, and there are some sex differences, but it's very socially constructed. It's almost like gender is socially constructed. These these what the systems almost systemically have set up, set us up to be impacted differently, right? And and in this, I think it is really important to understand sort of what can the system do. And what can our leadership do uh, to uh, to balance these um, over, or balance or overcome these disparities? So, Dr. Pin, oh, yes. No, go ahead. Finish your question. Yes. You just um, get, I just get fired up when you bring up those uh, <laughs> those points because I think that's something we've all come to really realize and recognize that we need to think about how we can improve healthcare in the post-pandemic era. And what have we learned about uh, uh, this pan? Learn from the lessons from this pandemic, and of course, leadership is, in essence, what we really need and need to look forward to in the future. So, continue with your thought, and then I'll be happy to respond. I think we're thinking along the same lines. So, let's dig into that a little bit and into the leadership. Um, so we see that U.S. We look at the number. I look at the numbers, and the stats show that uh, the numbers are increasing in terms of death rates and in terms of people exposed in the U.S. Uh, compared to a lot of countries around the world. And my question to you is, why is it? Why are the numbers so uh, so high in the U.S.? What is going on here? Well, I. <sighs> As I think about improving healthcare in general and leadership, and what I'd like to point out, not just to those who want to be leaders, but those who are just part of the broader community is that these days we really have to be aware of the socio-political aspects of healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, and keep in mind always the scientific basis of truth and of fact, especially as it applies to healthcare and what we know in terms of medical literature, scientific literature, and the health of our peoples. Um, just for example, and I think you were probably going to bring this up, and I don't want to say that all women are the best leaders, but we know that the countries that have had the best records at leveling off the curve and, yes. and at lower mortalities from this pandemic have recently actually been countries that are led by women. And, they're New Zealand, Denmark, Finland, Germany, uh, Ireland, and Norway, for example. Uh, and I don't think we can make a generalization. It'd be nice if we could, but we won't make a generalization that all women leaders are the best leaders. But it's very interesting that looking at this pandemic, the countries that have done best are those that have been led by women. And, and why is that? One of the theories is that women, if you look at that old parable about how when women and men are driving, women will stop and ask for directions, men won't, they assume they know where to go. Not to say all men are that way, however, it sort of points out something that has been considered as a reasoning here, and that is that that maybe women are more apt to to reach out for assistance, to reach out for advice, to not feel that they are totally in control of the facts, even if they are, uh, and to come to conclusions based on, on consultations and, and on information, basic information, while perhaps some of our male leaders are more concerned about projecting that in charge image 
and feeling that perhaps they know as much. And I think we've seen some public examples of that when someone without a history in science can say that they know as much as Dr. Anthony Fauci, who has given his life to science and and uh, and infectious diseases. And oh my gosh, I'd never begin to think something like that. And we've seen that. Leadership is important. And when you don't have a sign, this is the pandemic is actually a public health phenomenon. It's a public health tragedy. And if it's public health, you would think that the leadership would really be invested in those who are scientists and who are physicians, who are healthcare leaders, uh, and who have experience and knowledge to guide the rest of us in how to conduct ourselves, how to prevent the disease, how to overcome these disparities, and how to approach this. And that is not what we have seen. Uh, we know that in past times of epidemics, that we've seen leadership from primarily the, not the politicians, but from those who are in healthcare, the CDC, for example, would be giving the briefings, et cetera. And we've not seen that this time. And I don't wanna seem partisan at all and don't wanna do that. But if you ask, I think any of us involved in science and healthcare and public health, it would be that our major concern is that we probably would have done much better if the decisions about how this country would handle the coming pandemic and the pandemic once it was upon us was based upon scientific reasoning and the facts and leadership of those who have years of experience and knowledge in dealing with infectious diseases and epidemics and pandemics that we'd be in much better, better situation. I can't say I'm necessarily a big Dick Cheney fan, but I was thrilled when I saw the posting of him in a mask saying, real men wear masks. That was an example of leadership that wish we had seen more of because it just gets very concerning to me when I see people saying, why should I wear a mask? When we know that wearing a mask and social distancing are two things that we as individuals can do that would really go far in helping us to level the curve uh, of this uh, pandemic in the United States and preserve lives. Yes, we look up to our leaders to set an example, like the Dick Cheney's example is that, and it is also an identity, real men, like it's hitting, it's a bit stereotypical. That said, it's hitting the, the point, like the, the, the nail on the head, this is what we do. So you brought up a couple of things and I actually have run some studies over, time, uh, over the past few years that you got me to think about even unpublished data. A few years ago, I was wondering if uh, certain people are more willing to admit and say, I don't know than others and some correlational data. Again, this is a speculation on my end, but what I found is that the, um, the higher class and the richer, the more wealthy people are, they are less likely to, to say, I don't know. And this also correlated with power. The more power and position people had in the society or in their groups, in their communities, they were less likely to say, I don't know. And that's sort of the, your first comment uh, made me think of this. What do uh, leaders do? And uh, maybe we're not, um, when, in, when we're in leadership positions, we're not willing to accept feedback or we're not uh, willing to say, admit that we don't know and seek help. That might be driving uh, th these disparities be, um, between different leaders. I think a powerful leader, a strong leader, knows how to involve those around him or her, to get opinions from others, and to have those working with her or him to feel involved in the decision-making. That to me is a smart leader. A leader has to make the ultimate decision, but an informed decision is what is important. And I think a good leader, a smart leader, is one that can do that. Uh, learn how to, to delegate delegate responsibility uh, and at the same time know you're responsible so you have to monitor and be involved in what's going on but learn how to really bring about that synergy of wisdom and expertise of those that are around you which means as a good leader you surround yourself with individuals who can bring that expertise to advise you. I remember once as uh, actually I was a medical student and I was just learning how to write up autopsy protocols as a, uh, in pathology. And I had some questions and I asked my mentor who 
actually served as my mentor for many years. And I admitted there was something I didn't know. And I was leery about doing that because especially as a woman, you don't always want to admit there's something you don't know. But I, I didn't know and I didn't want to make a dumb statement. So I asked him, uh, uh, you know, something I didn't know. And I remember what he told me, which I've never forgotten. And that was that he was impressed with me because I knew when to admit I didn't know something. Often we're afraid to admit there's something we don't know. We don't always think about consultation. And we don't always think about seeking others to advise us, but there's nothing worse than somebody making pronouncements that you know are not correct because they don't want to admit they don't know. And I think that's extremely important when the lives of other people can depend upon your decision making. But again, back to your point, I think that is a real strong characteristic of a strong leader to know how to involve others, although you are in charge and ultimately is your decision, but you also bring about others who feel responsible along with you for the decisions that you make and therefore are going to be supportive of the actions you take. And that requires looking away from your neighbor, right? away from how do I look and who am I and how am I perceived to thinking, how can I use my resources, my leadership to empower others? Almost leadership, not in presence, but in absence. Like what happens when a leader leaves the room is the performance of those he or she has led, does it increase or do they do worse? And better leaders would perceive that as when I leave, my group does better. So it's not about me. Right? We work together and now it's about them and their talent and we've done this together. The other thing I want to emphasize, you've, you've, you've gotten me to think, is this, this um, leadership and our need during this time to legitimize science. Like, I really want to emphasize that. Uh, I think we need to hear that and not about only about facts, but scientific approach, scientific science. Um, as core to life and seeking our results. I love that you're talking. I don't want to speculate. There's some data showing that, but even seeing the data, you don't want to say this is it because there's so many different ways to test it, different ways to approach it. Um, and it's leadership is not only about one person, but it can be institutions. And perhaps we can say that we need institutions to show their leadership as well. You mentioned CDC recently, and I've uh, spent um, the past few weeks running some experiments on how... Um, information about uh, the pandemic needs to be framed. And, uh, and how can we frame it in, a, in an effective and efficient manner, the virus, so that um, people take it seriously and take proactive and pre um, preventative measures. And we found, so we've, we've identified some ways of framing the information. I don't wanna get in too much into it, right? But there's certain effective ways to get people to act. And then we went uh, with my two colleagues, we went and looked at um, the way that uh, most cited organizations like World Health Organization, John Hopkins, CDC, the way that they have framed information on their websites about the virus and its spread. And what we found is that John Hopkins does it best. They use the most effective um, language as well as World, World Health Organization. That said, CDC was at the bottom, both in terms of the effective language they use in terms of the descript describing the virus as well as its spread. So. Can I throw the ball back at you? What are we seeing with CDC cited everywhere, right? It's all over the news, yet they, there are all these unconscious bias. I don't know even they are aware, right? But we need them to, we need um, similar organizations to step up their game and, and, and fulfill the leadership role. Um, well, we're talking about a government agency that at least presently over which there is a political lens. Mm -hmm. And so when the language and the pronouncements are made with a political lens, uh, helping to frame or determine what can be said and how it should be said, it's going to affect, it's going to have an effect and affect what is said and how it is said. Hopkins, the World Health Organization, they're independent. They don't have to answer to any political uh, 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 political point of view. They are presenting the facts as they see them. Um, I know that during my time at NIH, um, you know, I do different administrations and different leadership. One of the most important things for us was to be able to make pronouncements or announce or give information based on findings of 
randomized clinical trials, which often did not end up with results that were expected. It was great if they did, but very often they didn't. And a major example of that was the Women's Health Initiative, which studied uh, the use of menopausal hormone therapy and came out with results that were not what people expected or not what people wanted because it went against the traditional viewpoint that a woman, as soon as she reaches menopause, should go on to, to menopausal hormone therapy. And fortunately, we were able to present the results based upon the scientific findings without having a political lens. Although we got a lot of criticism, we learned a lot about also how important it is, how you express findings, especially when they go against what the common thought is. So we learned a lot from that, but just an example of how important it is to be able to make statements based on the findings of science, pointing out where we don't have all the answers, but where in fact data has demonstrated something and proven what was expected or shown or disproven what was expected, but there's data and facts to, to document it. And I think that's the major difference in what we're seeing right now in terms of, of what is being put forward by different agencies, be it a government agency or an independent agency, either in the global community or in the US community. I mean, it's, it's hard to be a scientist during a time where, I mean, it's always hard to fight against the status quo, right? And especially if the status quo is really established and emphasized from top down, right? And then it's hard to be a scientist during this time. I was um, doing my readings about scientists over the past few centuries. I found out that in the 19th century, uh, scientists in many countries, uh, they had to fight for public recognition and of their work like they have to really seek to be recognized. But in the 20th century, it became national, um, they sought national endorsements and there was a planning for science that was organized. So it was top down, the system said science is important. And I feel like we might be dabbling between the two now and almost going back where the readership says, ah, science, we're not sure if it's, it's, it does not legitimize. Uh, and as a result, scientists are looking around uh, at the public Yet it's not a time in the pan pandemic for the um, for the uh, public to drive the change. Like when you are in a wartime, you you go down in your Maslow's of hierarchy to the bottom of the chain and say, "Where is my security?" That's shaken. So I cannot really think about how am I going to help others, how I'm going to make change and go out and walk. But I need to fix my problems. And what do you think about that? Is is leadership? Does it have to be in those times like top down, or can it be grassroots driven? So what what is what is the give and take there? I think it can be both, but I want to back up a second and say sure. a real scientist, a good scientist is not so concerned about getting credit, but is more concerned about getting the truth out and the truth being what we found from scientific investigation. And so if you have a decent or good leader and you have an excellent scientist, it's all right if that scientist reveals what he or she has found or demonstrated and give credit to the leader who can then say, this is what we found, but at least it's, it's taking forward what is the truth, the truth based in science, the truth based in, 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 non, non, uh, in, in investigation that is, that is based in true, investigate, true scientific investigative pursuits. Uh, and I, I just want to point that out. It's different if you are a scientist and you're in it and you want to find favor or fame because of what you do. And of course, I guess everybody has a little bit of that, but if you temper your results of, of what you find to make them seem more acceptable and to give you a little bit more fame instead of standing up for what the facts have shown you, uh, that's a slightly different world. But does the change come from the top down or from grassroots up? Again, let me go to my women's health background and let me just say it's a combination of things. Let's take the focus on women's health research, which had its origins in the grassroots community, but which then really brought about and was effectively uh, implemented because of attention from the top down. It was certainly women and the advocacy community, along with women in science and medicine, healthcare, but really it was grassroots advocacy that brought attention to the fact that research needed to address 
where studies had looked at men and assumed that the effects uh, were the same for women as for men with treatments or with uh, interventions, and that women need to be included in clinical trials so that you could tell whether or not there were sex or gender differences. It was then the Congress that then brought this concept to the leadership of NIH that then in turn responded to both the grassroots movement as well as the congressional leadership and said, we're going to give this a scientific approach and put in place a program and office and attention to finally looking at women's health research as a legitimate scientific pursuit. And so then we hope the influence of our office helped to lead to where we are today, which is that attention to sex and gender factors are pretty much accepted and understood that there are differences in, in, in onset of diseases and responses to treatments. So I think that's a good example of how mm -hmm. both grassroots can really bring attention to a topic and how it takes leadership from the top to help respond to that, to bring it about. I think we're seeing the same thing here in terms of health disparities. It is amazing to me, as long as we've been talking about disaggregation of data and looking for data, both male, female, biracial, ethnic groups, that as this pandemic hit, it was really the grassroots community that brought attention to the fact that there seemed to be more deaths in the communities of color reflecting what we've known for a long time about health disparities. And then we began to see a response. I was told and couldn't believe that, that hospitals were not collecting data uh, looking at racial ethnic uh, uh, criteria. And so I checked with, uh, with a couple of hospitals in a certain city in the Northeast and found out that many of them were not collecting that data at all. And I was pleased that one that I have an affiliation with um, they were collecting the data, but pointed out to me that not a single city, state, or national agency had requested that they look at the data and record the data. They were just doing it because of their concerns about reporting, demo, having information about demographics of their patient population. Then all of a sudden, people were surprised. My gosh, there seemed to be health disparities in the effects of this, this virus. And then all of a sudden now, we're trying to recoup the data, much of which has been lost from the original onset of this pandemic to really document where there are differences and are they just for racial and ethnic differences, socioeconomic background. Mostly there was some data on age, but looking at many of those other factors, we're really behind on getting that data. I can't believe that wasn't thought of to begin with. So here's an example of this pandemic of where grassroots attention has really brought the attention of quote unquote leadership of those in charge to what they should have been thinking about to begin with. And hospitals are not alone. The businesses I look at and work with, the lack of data is mind blowing. It's very common, right? We talk about the data age, yet we have not collected data in across organizations, <clears throat> across governments. So then we have to look at our leadership. So we have a few minutes, Dr. Pin, and I wanna ask you, what do we do? What, what are the principles of a good leader? So if we're gonna give them a map, or here is how we move forward, what shall we look for in a leader? What should we expect of a leader, of a, of a good leader to, to get us? Well, us? just thinking in general, um, first of all, a good leader has to know where he or she wants to lead. You mm. can't be in charge if you don't know where you're going. You can't be effective if you don't know where you want to get and how you're going to get there. So it's most important that a leader have confidence in his or herself, not arrogance. I really detest arrogance. I think arrogance in a leader is not a good thing and can be destructive, but self-confidence that you can lead, self-confidence so that you can consult with others, self-confidence so that you can delegate and enough information. And if you don't have the information, utilizing resources and utilizing um, the synergy of, of of collaboration to gain the information that one needs to make the ultimate decision, which a leader has the responsibility for. You can't lead and then not lead, say I'm in charge, but you determine this and you determine that and I had nothing to do with it, it's your decision. If 
I'm in charge, it's ultimately my responsibility. The buck stops here. And so even if I didn't give it as much attention as I might have, I have to take the responsibility if I allowed you as someone under me to implement something or make a decision that didn't work out well, but that's my responsibility as the leader. So bottom line is having self-confidence, not arrogance, knowing where you want to lead when you leave, where to go, feeling comfortable enough to be able to get the information that's needed to make the decisions and the talent to move forward. And then let me bring up my four E's as I think about leadership and leadership in healthcare in the post-pandemic era and what we most need for leadership going forward. I've given a lot of thought to this as I've heard of discussions about not just health disparities, but those who are dealing with patients on all levels, those who are in the community, uh, who are having to deal with the, the, the results of seeing, of the as isolation and, and then seeing family losses. And the first thing I thought of was empathy. We really need empathy, not just each of us for individuals we know, but in our leadership, how are we going to be effective leaders in healthcare or in most anything, if you don't have some degree of empathy, because empathy to me can help affect, uh, can help affect uh, how you approach a problem and how you lead those who are following you to make a difference. And then with that, thinking about equity. And certainly as we look at some of the issues from the pandemic, we know that everything has not been related to equity. How, was this, how were decisions made about who would have access to testing and where the testing would go? If there are limited numbers of PPEs, who were the ones who get that? Were they just hospital workers or the bus drivers or whatever? And how do you deal with that? Uh, how, who makes a decision when there are limited number of respirators? Who gets that respirator? And just thinking about uh, how you deal with equal application of healthcare speaking of healthcare world or in general, the principles that you're applying. And then ethics, because to me, the principles of ethics are so important, especially in healthcare. We can't forget the rules of ethics and that should really guide us in all of our decision-making. And we need leaders who are aware and who feel ethical behavior and ethical decision-making as being part and parcel of the leadership process. And then finally, excellence. And by excellence, I mean doing your best, leading those around you to do your best. And I can't get away from science because if you're excellent, you're basing your decision-making on scientific endeavors, scientific data, and based upon not the whim of what I'd like to see, but based upon data of what we have documented. So I kind of like those. I've sort of come in the last last month or so to think about these as my four E's. I'm sure there are many other E's and non-E's that could be put forward, but they just sort of summarized for me as I thought about this many a night and after many a discussion and many interviews and many news stories and thinking, gosh, what we really need to see in our leadership now is empathy, equity, ethics, and excellence. So that's my brief summary. I'd like to know what you think. I mean, that have been the, the four E's. Yes. That's not, I, to me, those are almost like manual to being a good human, right? It is not only that we should expect that from our leaders, but th those are the um, dimensions, the principles that we, we need to um, follow in our lives because we're all leaders in our communities, in our lives. Right? Leadership starts at the individual level. Like, yes, we, we can be serving leaders, we can follow. And as we look up, we should go with our hearts and you know, look, look around us. We should ask the question, am I leading, leading an ethical life? Who has access in my life? What am I providing? Is it equal or equitable? And am I doing the best that I can to be a good person during this time? And I think those are going to lead our, our, uh, our own behaviors. Am I wearing a mask? Am I keeping a six foot um, social distancing? Am I respecting that? And am I protecting those people around me? So I love those things. Thank you for sharing those. Something that I, I can hold on to very easy to remember. <laughs> Maybe it's um, these four E's. It's, uh, they're lovely. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi, Jean. Welcome. I think your microphone is off. Yeah, there we go. They just unmuted me. Great. Okay. Well, what a fascinating conversation. And I think what an inspiring uh, uh, place to open uh, ourselves up to questions uh, from, from those of us who uh, have been listening to your conversation. Uh, we have a first question that uh, certainly those of us coming from a business school, it's it's been on our mind. And it's an intriguing one that that I think we would be very interested in both of your thoughts on. And that is around how we balance the scientific reasoning of the medical community with, uh, with well, what we like to think of uh, as scientific reasoning from the economic community. So we've, you know, we've, we've, we've heard a lot about the consequences to the economy and uh, uh, people talking about utilitarian ethics and, and uh, you know, how do we balance those two? So very interested in how you see those two different perspectives, the trade-offs between them, um, and, and how we move forward, uh, given uh, it seems kind of irresolvable how we accomplish uh, and honor those two sets of reasonings together. Lalan, do you want to take no, a Dr. first Dr. question? Dr. Pin, uh, please, <laughs> and I will try to follow. I would love to listen and learn. When I'm talking about health and the importance of health, I usually start by saying, if you don't have good health, then you're not going to be able to do other things. And good health is important for almost any pursuit that we might have in our lives. So you need good health if you're going to be able to function and contribute to the economy. Certainly, we all recognize, and I suffer with watching those individuals who are talking about not having any incomes because they've lost their jobs because of isolation and wanting things to open up so they can get salaries. But, and I don't want to say it comes down to just what is the importance of a human life versus perhaps being destitute for a month or more, because that sounds rather cold. And let me protect that idea of empathy I talked about. But there are ways with conversations that I think have been discussed, for example, with this pandemic or just in general, where you really need to balance how you can not forget the economic consequences of, of the science you're promoting and at the same time preserve scientific principles uh, to preserve human life. If you, you are approaching this from, I, I guess to me, human life is important. And if you are not preserving human life, are you willing to sacrifice human life so that some can, can, can return quicker to, to economic recovery? Is that really what we want? Is that really what we should be about? And as we can see that, you know, with the emphasis on, on protecting the economy, we're now seeing reversals. And not only are we seeing uh, more affected by the virus by opening up and, and loosening some of our approach to, to preventing the spread of the virus, but also we're seeing those who are who were looking to benefit from the economic recovery now suffering again because there's been a reversal and some places are closed down again. So to me, it's a matter of when I talked about that synergy, that synergy, it means communication and taking the right approach, considering both the economic factors as well as the scientific factors for a better human outcome, keeping in mind both equity and empathy uh, and, uh, and ethics, if you will. So it doesn't have to be one versus the other. N not one should be dominant over the other, but to me, it's it's that interaction, communication to work out together what would be most beneficial. Dr. Then you put it beautifully. I think the, the world is telling us what is, so with the opening of states, we're seeing the numbers and, mm -hmm. and we cannot ignore the human side. And here in this situation, it is very, like human health, essential well-being. And this question, I love it because uh, it, it hits home for me because as a business school professor mm -hmm. who cares a lot and thinks a lot about human condition, I struggle with this a lot in my classroom. And I think I'm, I'm proud to be part of Darden, Darden community, because this is what we get up in the morning to teach our students. 
that the economy and uh, profits cannot drive, cannot be the ultimate goal. It can be a product, it can be an outcome, right? But we have to lead with a human-centered human focus, with ethics, right? We don't teach those separately, right? Yes, we have ethics course and marketing course, but we teach together because those, those only go hand in hand and can only make the world better. And as, as Dr. Pin put it, the, 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 the numbers show, show it. Like if you're only thinking about, about the economics, the numbers, the world will come and humans will tell us that's not, that's not what matters. You cannot have a good economy without taking care of the mental, psychological, physical well-being of your citizens. And that's and where- think about the percentage of our expenditures in this country for health care. And so if you're looking to preserve the economy, we really need to also be conscious of what, what, what decisions we make and how that will affect how our national budget now, I'm not a budget person, but mm -hmm. how that will be affected by the cost related to the loss of human life that would be contributing to the economic state of the country, as well as the cost for taking care of those who are sick or who are ill. Yeah. Let, let's stay with that uh, that conversation about the healthcare system itself. We've talked a little about the consequences cost-wise. Uh, wondering, uh, Dr. Pin, there's a question for you uh, from uh, Dan Smith asking whether you see any correlation between countries with universal healthcare and the number of cases. And a, a, a second part of that question, wondering if you think this will change the nature of the public conversation about providing universal health care in the U.S. That's, a, that's quite a challenging question. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. I don't have the data to be able to answer knowledgeably about uh, the differences in, in rates for countries that have universal health care. But the last part of that question, I think, is an important one. It is clear that uh, the, what we found during this pandemic um, have, has already begun to change how we think about healthcare and changes we're going to have to make. How do we even, uh, what do we do better for access to healthcare for all? Uh, for those under the current system who don't have insurance and therefore may not have gone for testing or were afraid to go for testing or to be seen when they were sick because they were afraid they couldn't they couldn't care or didn't have private physicians and didn't want to stand in those blocks long lines in the in the rain to be seen to find out whether or not they could be tested to go home. Um, this whole question of universal health care, I think the concept is an important one. We really need to see access, ac actual access to health care for everyone. How that is delivered is certainly debatable. And I'm not sure I've heard anyone put it forward in a way that I would like to really embrace right now myself, uh, except the concepts. I just think we've labored over this for some time. I'm not an economist and I'm not a, 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 a and I don't, you know, I've been involved in healthcare and policy making, uh, but I think there are many issues related to universal health care, all the way from looking at the role of the physician and the nurse and the physician's assistant and the nurse practitioner and the pharmacist and the community administrators that have to be considered in addition to how that health care would be meted out, how it would provide, how it be provided, uh, what procedures would be available. We've heard about positives and negatives from some of the countries that have universal health care. It's not always as wonderful as we hear about it, um, but I think that this has to be a central topic of discussion starting now, if not starting yesterday. What I liked was an article that I read by a couple of folks talking about, you know, what's gonna, what's the result of recognizing disparities from this pandemic. And the bottom line of that article, which I fully agree with, was we don't need more commissions to study. We don't need more committees to consider. We need to start taking action. And part of that action needs to be considering how we can make healthcare, access to healthcare, and equitable access to healthcare available for, for all of our population. I, if I had the answer to that, 
I'd probably be on my way to the Nobel Prize. And not exactly. put down. Right. that was a strong question. And I wish I did have the answer. So thank you for that. I'm sorry. I just don't have the answer. But those are just some of my thoughts about that. Well, well, uh, well, Dr. Pin, when you already have a college and a hall, I think the Nobel <laughs> is the logical third step in that. <laughs> no so, uh, I, I think we, we could work with that. Um, on the subject of equity, uh, interesting uh, question has been raised. Uh, so this vaccine that we're all waiting with bated breath for and hoping uh, when, it, when it magically appears will allow us to go back to leading uh, the lives we once led, what are the principles for equitable distribution of that scarce vaccine when it arrives? Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, uh, uh, because we, we haven't really started thinking about that, but, but to me that's going to really raise in a very stark way uh, our commitment to equity. Well, I know that I've heard from individuals who work in in some communities of color and, uh, and who've been reaching out, trying to prepare individuals in those communities to be ready for the vaccine and to be receptive when it's ready because one of the points of equity is to make sure that everyone has access to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, there are, there are many in the communities at the grassroots level who are concerned and say they don't want to take the vaccine. One, they hear the message of the anti-vaccers, which gets me very concerned, but that's there. Secondly, they hear, and it's, a, it's almost surprising, but it shows how smart our grassroots people are. They hear the discussion about rushing to prepare a vaccine, and they're concerned that perhaps if the vaccine is released too early, while the push has been, let's get an early vaccine, will it have been tested long enough or well enough that they can feel comfortable that it is a safe vaccine over a period of time. Thirdly, uh, to ensure that those who are working on the vaccine are inclusive in their clinical trials so that there's diversity among those who are included in the clinical trials so that the data in fact does give us information about both women and men and subpopulations of women and men so that communities will feel comfortable knowing that the results should be applicable to them also. And then knowing that, as we've even heard Dr. Fauci and others say, no vaccine is 100% perfect. And that uh, I think he said the measles is the one with the highest percent, maybe that's uh, uh, in the 90 per somewhere in the 90th percentile, and that he would be happy even if it was at the 75th percentile or somewhere in that range, which again is going to send a signal of concern. But at the same time, we wanna make sure that if there is a vaccine available, that we convince members of our community to take it. To me, it's, it's what the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH has been putting forward. It really means that we need community involvement, not just of, the, of those in healthcare, but of community leaders to bring their communities to be accept, to understand about the vaccine and to help convince the members of their communities of the importance of that and to assist in making sure that the vaccine gets out there. Now, the cost of the vaccine, is that going to be prohibitive? Is it going to be prohibitive if you don't have insurance to cover that? If your providers don't have access, how is the vaccine going to be distributed? These are all things that need to be carefully considered and certainly given much more attention than, for example, how testing for the virus was handled, because we know there were many problems there. I've read so many articles published in the scientific literature, not in addition to those in the lay literature and through conversations, but even published in the scientific literature of individuals, especially people of color, who had some symptoms and wanted to be tested, but were told that they didn't meet the CDC criteria, so they didn't get testing, and then eventually came down with, with documentable COVID-19 and died because they were so sick by the time they got to the hospital. So how we can make sure that the vaccine is more easily accessible than the testing has been is going to be another important factor. 
I don't have all the answers, but to me, those are some of the things that need to be considered and discussed. Professor Onik, anything to add to that? Oh, yes, tell back to Paulo. Um, uh, uh, well, it, it, as we think about this, one of the, the questions that gets raised uh, uh, is we're, those of us on this call are uh, most likely people of privilege. We've been able to stay safe and well to a great extent uh, and have had the luxury of doing that. Uh, what can we do as individuals to, uh, to, to address this inequity, to address and help uh, those who don't have the same privilege we do to protect themselves and stay safe? The, the people that you talked about earlier, Dr. Pin, the bus drivers and the folks working in supermarkets and, and pushing, uh, pushing people in wheelchairs around the hospital. What are your thoughts uh, at that level of kind of taking individual responsibility for some actions? Lalin, I've been doing all the talking. No, handle been, this. Please, uh, this, this hour is, I mean, I, I, am, I am guiding and I'm, I'm dancing with you, but I am, uh, <laughs> please, do a few minutes. So please, I'd love to hear. And then if there's time, I'll add a few words, yes. Well, the answer to that really goes back to addressing deep issues of, of, our, of, our, of our economic and social environment in the country. They're not things that can be solved immediately. And in the short term, there needs to be a recognition of, 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 of for example, providing PPE for those who are in direct contact in service positions. And I keep using the bus driver as an example because uh, there was an article in the news, which many of you may have heard about a bus driver who actually was making a plea to his, his, uh, the riders of his bus to please wear a mask and please not cough, et cetera, because he was concerned about the, the, the COVID-19 virus. And eventually, and he was making a plea to those that rode his bus. And eventually, he did come down and died from the virus. And yeah. so you think that people who, who, who cannot socially be socially distant, if they're living in a multi-generational family, and we know that that often is the case, but those who are not more well-to-do or economically privileged. And so while they may wear the mask when they go home, you've got multiple generations. It may be a young person and you've got grandparents there that they may unwittingly bring the bring the virus too. So, um, so we need to, to one, be concerned to see what can be done to provide, uh, to provide some support. Uh, there were numerous articles and documented, documented cases of those who were in the service industry who were not allowed to stay home once they had symptoms and then they weren't able to get the test. And so that contributed in, of whole families that ended up being affected by the virus. So we need to make sure that employers uh, are paying attention to the issues of their employees. Again, it's going to be stressful on income and stressful on the economy. But again, if you lose a whole family or lose a series of workers, it's, it's, it's a problem. So I think all the things we've talked about are important and, and just recognizing where you can make a difference in being empathetic or even sympathetic mm -hmm. to what an individual might be facing, even if it's in your own apartment building, for example, and you see someone who needs to go to the grocery store, maybe you can help with that person getting groceries or going out or getting to the drugstore uh, just to relieve them from having to go out and to be exposed to bring things home. It, it could, for us on an individual level, it sort of comes down to just being personally empathetic and understanding of those around us, as well as situations over which we may have some control to make a difference and bring forward that empathy I keep talking about to me is just a good word to, to, to put forward the concept of understanding that everyone may not be as privileged as each of us is, and we need to understand that. Professor Anik? I think my answer was what 
uh, one of Dr. Pin's E's, which is empathy. Uh, it is looking outside of ourselves. Empathy has many meanings, but it is having somebody else's heart in ours, right? It is turning outside of ourselves. And that is what we need to do right now to check in with our privileges, right? Uh, check in with our biases and looking outside rather than gazing. I think we're past that Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom. We are past that security. I mean, we're, we're sort of establishing that we have the privileges to establish that. Now we have to look around and see what other people uh, need. And Dr. Pin, you brought up sort of institutions or, or, or work, let's say restaurants force their workers to be, to be at work. So we can go in, as they're asking for us to wear masks, we can go in and ask, what have you done? So we have our um, like grassroots, like in, as individuals, we, we should carry that responsibility of looking around and asking people in power, institutions, companies, whatever it is, restaurants to, to say, hey, what are you doing to protect your people? Like not only me, but what are you doing to protect the community? What are your contributions? So we should hold them accountable and responsible. Yeah. Well, like assist them also. Yes. As well as the system, right, right. Well, I think that is an inspiring uh, a note to end our conversation on, a reminder uh, to take our privilege and to look for ways to respond empathetically uh, to help those it, it, who don't have that privilege. Um, well, let me just thank both of you, Dr. Penn, Professor Onik, uh, for a really fascinating conversation on a topic uh, uh, that we just can't imagine anything could be more important right now than the issue of health equity. And uh, also to thank all of our listeners. Uh, we, had, uh, we have a lot of folks joined us, heartening to see uh, such interest, and uh, uh, we hope you've enjoyed the discussion and look forward to welcoming you to more Leadership Unscripted talks in the future. So thank you very much.